Welcome. There's just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday the 22nd of September and you are watching episode 23 of Regional Rap. Regional Rap, providing an insight to issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates and joining me on this episode is the state of Queensland's finances impeding re regional development my, is my guest, Dr. Marcus Smith. Dr. Smith is an experienced applied economist with a history of working in data analytics and evidence-based government policy development, the higher education industry, consulting, advocacy, and small business management. He holds a PhD in economics from Griffiths University with research specialization in evaluation investments in renewable and natural resources, assets under uncertainty. Dr. Smith is highly skilled in analytical accounting and financial management. Econ <laughs> econometrics, statistics, quantitative finance and financial engineering. He was formerly the chief economist for the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Queensland, based in Brisbane. In this role, he was the principal of CCIQ's data analytic site and analysts of the whole survey of Queensland and business sentiment, published it, publishing evidence-based articles relating to Queensland's regional studies of employment, economic conditions and development, as well as the state and national trade. I'm glad I've got that out of the way. Welcome, Dr. Good Smith. Nice. Good job. Um, well, just before we move on to it, Maybe you can highlight some of those things that we're probably not uh, familiar with, like econometrics. 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 Yeah, econometrics. That's, that's essentially the modelling that we use, um, uh, that economists use. Um, you know, uh, can can it, it's a broad um, array of um, of modelling uh, concepts. So. Um, yeah, did you want to tell me to tell you a little bit more about myself and just, just before you, yeah, like, could you give us a bit of a background and what, where you come from, your childhood, and how you got into this field, um, and what what pointed you in that direction? Yeah, definitely. I, I was born in Townsville. Um, I, uh, my parents um, owned a, a squash centre for most of my life, so I, I travelled uh, all over. Um, all over North Queensland and, and Queensland and Australia as well. Uh, so back then, um, uh, in, the, in those early heydays, squash was actually quite a big sport and we were pretty much travelling almost every weekend uh, around regional areas, particularly in North Queensland. Um, uh, I went overseas for a few years. I played professionally, came back and, um, and uh, went to, to Griffith University in Brisbane, uh, spent eight and a half years there doing my three degrees. After that, I moved back to Townsville for a, for a couple of years and, and worked for the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. It was back then, and then obviously Yasi came through and wiped out the forestry um, plantations, and it became the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, which it which it remains. So my my role there was to predominantly work with sugarcane growers, also uh, beef producers as well, but um, we were focused in around the, the Burdekin, um, as well as the, um, the, the Burdekin dry tropics, the wet tropics up in, in Ingham and, and North Queensland, etc., and then down to um, and Mackay and Childers and, and that area. So um, my role was, this was when, um, when Campbell Newman uh, took over government. And essentially, I was I was employed during that time of the the, the freeze, um, where very few people were. But the role that I was given with all the reef regulations was they'd come up with all these policies and all these uh, management practices to to improve water quality on the reef. And obviously, it's a very controversial um, issue. Um, so my role was to come in and, and try and model what the economic uh, benefits or costs would be for, for growers to incorporate those new improved uh, practices because uh, none of that work had been done. So, so essentially, I spent a couple of years um, developing those models and the, and the research 
um, framework uh, for for and I built my team there from from two to uh, I think it's about six people nowadays um, that are working in that in that particular um, office now. Uh, so after that, I, I took on a role as the uh, as a finance lecturer, and and I was pretty much run the finance across all of the different campuses for JCU uh, based in Townsville. I did that for a couple of years, uh, then I left in 2007 and then came down to Brisbane and then started working with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland in those things that you mentioned. So predominantly I, I was, my major role was to look at business sentiment in, in Queensland, all across Queensland. Uh, so we have a survey that we were running every quarter. Uh, so that gives a good insight. Um, I read every response from, from businesses uh, so we, we'd gauge everything from profit to to uh, to capital expenditures to employment, all of these metrics, um, as well as barriers to to you know for, for businesses to grow and, and invest. Uh, what some of those problems were for them? Uh, yeah, after that, I've, I've just been consulting, uh, consult a little bit now in industry analysis, looking at employment in particular regions. Um, also looking at um, at uh, the Pacific Labor uh, Program. Uh, I've done a few studies there on particular industries and, and looking at where skill shortages are, are likely to be uh, the most acute and uh, to, to try and target that program. Well, I'd like to come back later in the show just to your part in the reef regulations or the uh, basically modelling forum and the impact uh, of those regulations. But we'll, we'll stick with the original theme of the show in regards to um, doing business in Queensland, or I suppose in, in Australia in general, is, is becoming more and more difficult according to business. Uh, there's always, they're always putting out there, there's these roadblocks, roadblocks, roadblocks. Maybe except for if you're in the green economy, there's well, it seems to be a lot less roadblocks and a, a bit more enthusiasm mm -hmm. by the government to help you get there. Um, yeah. our finances. I mean, I had on Professor AJ Brown uh, a couple of weeks ago, and back mm -hmm. in a 2016 interview with Robbie Catter and uh, Jason Murphy, another economist, he sort of argued that Queensland was bankrupt. Uh, he wasn't saying, he wasn't really pointing out that there was bankrupt in the technical term, but what it was is the daily costs of government are starting to encroach too much on the revenue. So it limits its capacity to do uh, the equivalent of growth uh, or incentivize uh, wealth creation projects and things like that. Now, from your observations and skills, do you feel that sort of the percentage of the cost of running the government has sort of increased to a point where it's it's detrimental to the overall economy? Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, when, when you look at it, I've got, I've got a few graphs that we can go through later. We can see it 2008 and 2009 gross debt. Um, we had a, We had a budget of about $40 billion then. Um, our, our gross debt was a, um, you, you know, was about 50, uh, 50 billion. Um, so that's grown now to almost 130 billion um, over that time. And revenue is really, it's sitting at about 60 billion for the Queensland government, about 70 billion for all of the local councils as well as the state government. Um, it, it's it's certainly blown out. And, and the, the issue, with the debt is obviously you have to service it. And as the treasurer has been, um, you know, with very low interest rates for, for governments in particular to borrow, um, their argument is that we, you know, we're, we're okay at the moment because interest rates are low, but you know, when they start to rise, it, it's, it's certainly going to be a problem with, with trying to service that going forward, uh, as well as to provide, you know, money for infrastructure, to, to, to grow the pie, to, to enable businesses to um, better infrastructure and for the regions to grow. So we can, you know, uh, there's a lot, the, the public service as well, this is the first 
first year the, the expenses actually fell <laughs> over the over <laughs> COVID. But these have been um, obviously since um, the fourteen thousand were were removed when um, Campbell Newman came to power. Um, they've increased significantly um, since then. Over the since two thousand and six, the public service has grown um, on average at two and a half percent. Um, so um, that that's been an issue, and and obviously service delivery is is it's not not to say that you know with doctors and nurses and 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 um, emergency uh, personnel, you know, our police, our, our ambulance and fire uh, fighters. I mean, they're the front line, and 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 that's fair enough. But the you the bureaucracy itself, it's a bit makes up about ten percent of what what's not classed as frontline. So these are all the managers and everything um, that are sitting in the, the public service. So it's about 235,000 of them in the state government alone um, of, of, of its total full-time equivalent workforce. Um, you've, you've, got to, you've got to think with, with respect to, to, to bureaucrats or, or pen pushers as, as we call them. And, you know, the ones that look at approvals and, and all the, you know, and developing up all the red tape and, and, and implementing it um, and executing it. Um, essentially, you know, when, when that starts to grow, then, then you've got a problem with, with business being able to, 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 it becomes more expensive and more difficult to do business. Um, you know, every time you turn around, there's a, there's a public servant with a handout for $10,000 when, you, when you're a business, it, you know, it, it just becomes um, a drag on, on economic activity. Um, and you know, back in the back in the uh, you know a few decades ago, Queensland was 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 certainly a different place where where we prided ourselves on a low tax, um, you know, low regulation uh, economy, state economy. Um, you know that has reversed a lot in in, in you know recent times. With, with these bureaucrats too, at levels we're sort of thinking about are very expensive. Their wages are very high. Yep. Um, that. The superannuation benefits, you know, are fairly generous. The leave benefits are fairly generous. Um, so that's one cost impost. But then we've got on top of the actual working uh, or employ employed bureaucrats, we've also got another layer consultant, which is, a, is another yeah. different cost, but still the taxpayer and the government cost. And I think one of the other things I would note is that their structure is fairly um, sharp peaked. Like you go up levels fairly quickly. You've got only, you haven't got a spread across the bottom and one person looking after 10. It's more like one person with three and then it's, the pyramid keeps going up sharply, get into these uh, pay scales. So do you think the, the system is not broad enough? It, it's not, it's, it's too, um, senior orientated so people have different levels to accumulate different uh, wage increments and that yeah definitely the, the average is about uh, is about 117,000 per the 250 full-time equivalent uh, employees in Queensland so uh, that's uh, the wage bills quickly rising to to 28 billion dollars a year um, with it with a revenue base of about uh, of about 60. For the, for the state government. Um, you mentioned the consultants and, and that is something that, that certainly doesn't turn up, which is a very onerous cost for, um, uh, for the government itself. You know, the, the, there is a lot of that and, and it's, it, it doesn't make its way into the, the, the budget. So you can't really flesh it out, you know, the, how much it's being spent in that area. Um, and the other thing I will, mention about the superannuation uh there are those expenses are put into the, the budget you can see those but queensland was is the only state that actually has a has its own fund to that that, that actually at, at once it used to until this year which is an important thing i'll get to um it has its own fund that that's that that has totally covered all of those costs. This the Auditor General put a report out the, uh, very recently, a few months ago, um, that looked at that and and saw that it was essentially insolvent. The value of the the liabilities were worth more than the value of the assets in the fund. So that that's uh, has become a problem now. Um, but that is a, a 
peculiar a, a peculiarity of uh, the the Queensland budget where we have uh, financed our superannuation liabilities going forward. But the you know the the top end when you know a lot of these um, the, the the bureaucrats that are at the top as you mentioned, um, you know a lot of them are up to a million dollars uh, you know a year in in wages. Some of the bureaucrats run in these departments. Um, well, you know, that's, that's almost twice the, the amount paid. the prime minister gets. Yeah, certainly, and the premier. <laughs> Why is it? <laughs> so. but, but the thing is, they only have a. I probably, I probably be a bit giving them too much credit, but just have an eight to five job, five days a week. Probably have a have a first class travel and um, plenty of holidays with their family, and not too many onerous overtime chores. So mm -hmm. um, it's probably not a bad gig. Yeah. Did send me send me some uh, information. Is there any at the moment you want me to display in particular? Um, no, not at all. I, I sent that through. That if you wanted to share some of the the actual statistics, where we can we can start to see where you know where yeah. revenues and expenses and and debt in the state has has evolved. I've also got in there the the capital spend, so the capital works and grants that that the state government uh, over time how that's developed. Um, which is important too, because um, you know when, when we're paying, when we're developing debt and paying that off, that that's essentially money that could uh, go towards you know more hospitals, more roads, more dams. Um, you know we haven't built a dam in in you know decades, so um, and that's you know become a real problem, and and it it reached a I guess a, a, a boiling point, um, you know, up to the last election, where where thankfully we've had rain. Uh, last year, which which gave some relief, but we were we were in, in dire straits, and and it was starting to impact on on agricultural output and production. Um, you know, the looking at the what we had with the um, with the uh, the previous government uh, bringing back the the new Bradfield scheme. Um, you know, I thought that that was a great idea. Obviously, very expensive. It would take obviously the funds to come uh, from the feds to to come on board um to move forward with that but i thought that could have been a, a great initiative to you know a nature a nation building project which which had massive benefits uh i met with Celia helsher who who um was one of the uh, you know our top bureaucrats um, back in the back in the days he served across numerous governments um and treasurers uh he's probably the most decorated uh public servant we've had as, as under treasurer. Uh, he helped develop, well, pretty much develop with treasury, the, the coal and, and bauxite and aluminium industries that we have. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a long time. Uh, we had the LNG um, industry develop over, you know, uh, the, the middle of last uh, decade, um, over those few years there, and that's online now. But really, it's been a long time since we've, we've sort of developed a, a, a really you know significant industry like that and um that you know we're, we're looking the government's talking about manufacturing and, and all this advanced manufacturing and everything we saw the announcements today that in toowoomba that they're going to be going along with uh, boeing's going to be building their planes there and we're looking at aeronaut uh, looking at space technology and all of this going forward um other advanced manufacturing is pharmaceuticals and medicaments and and these sort of things um, but if, if you look at the statistics, manufacturing and and um, and and agriculture in particular have been in decline, um, you know, for, for the last decade uh, in particular. So you know, how we're we going to revive that, um, uh, you know, if it's intensive manufacturing uh, sector, then then obviously you've got problems with with energy costs uh, when we're moving to you know to to our new technologies now. Uh, moving away from coal, which was very cheap, um, relatively cheap, uh, you know, and then you've got sort of labour costs too, which are prohibitive. So, you know, how this is, it's easy for politicians to come and say, well, we're just going to develop our manufacturing and, you know, everything's going to be fine. Um, you know, but but how that actually happens with, with you know, you, you have to have business conditions right. Um, otherwise, businesses aren't going to invest. Oops, we lost you. Yep. We, we lost your photo for a sec. You're coming back. There you go. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Um, just picking up on that. Um, having a bit of problem with we'll, it. We'll, yep. uh, keep with you. Um, 
you'll be able to keep hearing us anyway. Yeah. The, the, one of the big problems is the key things you've got to have is plenty of water and plenty of electricity and cheap electricity. If you haven't got those two components, you got, you got to be battling to reintroduce um, major industry. Uh, we're looking at things now like the Council Hydrogen Hub. Uh, admittedly, they're going to run on wind farms and all that sort of thing, but they also need, need water. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems. And because they're going to produce what they call blue hydrogen, which basically requires for every kilogram of um, hydrogen you produce, you've got to use nine litres of water, of potable water. And that water is also exported to Japan. So when they send the kilo of uh, hydrogen to um, uh, Japan, they'll also be sending nine litres of water for every kilogram. So I think that might have been a little bit of the incentive to add the extra height to the Burdekin Dam that's just been talked about recently. Um, but it's, it's full short of the original 14.6 metres of height proposed when it was first built in a stage two. Yep. So that, so that is, is becoming a real problem. And, and you're talking about the lack of vision in regards to big projects. And maybe that's because the federal government in particular has, is eyeing off too many small things that should, shouldn't, it shouldn't be interested in, you know? It's, yep. It started to leave its scope of uh, responsibilities and really sort of be involved too, too close with some of these projects and different and different um, oper operators and that. Uh, did you see that as a problem as well? Well, uh, I, having a look at um, the, 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 the latest federal government infrastructure, um, so I've sent you a copy of that and some of the projects from the Northern Australia. Sorry, I keep dropping out there. I'm having problems with my, um, with my video there. Um, so essentially you've got that hydrogen, um, just, you know, Northwest of, of Townsville there at Georgetown, you've got that, um, the, the hydrogen, uh, sorry, the, um, the, um, the hydroelectricity, uh, it's the dam going in. Yep. Um, you know, what, what's been a big problem in, in Queensland is particularly with, you know, when we see it across our. Our, our, you know, with with Adani and what happened there, you know, a decade to, to get approvals. And then you've got Acton, which are well over a decade now trying to get stage two going of their projects. So um, their expansion down, um, you know, in those Southern Downs. But essentially we've had this problem of, of getting approvals to get things done. It's just, it, it, it's it's very difficult. And, and I think the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund is about six, projects um, predominantly that uh, you've got C CQU and also JCU are doing some expansions out of it. You've got the, um, the car park going in at the, at the hospital in, in Townsville, but, um, and then there's a, a project to expand the, the uh, ability to export more bauxite up in, in Cape York. But, uh, they're, they're pretty much the the only projects that have really got off the ground on the on the five billion. They've already allocated three point one billion to the northern Australia, but a lot of it's outside of of Queensland, um, in particular. So, you know, the, the copper string is obviously moving forward, which I think will be a great thing to open up our our mineral provinces. But I mean, this is the thing we we need we're going to need dam infrastructure and in that as well and. Uh, it's really been a big problem for outback Queensland in particular. When when I'm when I've been following the unemployment rates out there, they're, they're up around about thirty percent in in some in in some areas out there. Um, you know, so so the to be able to to if we can develop the the outback and 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 the north, um, you know, we're going to need that water supply, and that's where I mentioned the the um, the Bradfield scheme would have been a great way of being able to, it would have pretty much changed the whole outback by diverting water out there. People could move in and, and we could uh, decentralize from, from Southeast Queensland where, you know, 70% of the state reside. Um, 
you know, ha having a look at these projects, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's only it's a good start uh, but we're going to certainly need to see more and, and we're going to have to see it rolled out um, as we can but it, then you've got the problem too with with finding labor and, and you've got you know large skill shortages now which, which are starting to bite we've got problems with with the supply uh, supply chains uh, with getting materials etc um, you know we, we've got a massive housing boom that's that's come from the home builder project you know prices have, have risen um 16 percent um in the state alone um you know we're, we're short of construction workers uh the engineers i've talked to a lot of en engineers that are telling me that they're very short on engineers as well to um you know to to work on these projects and then we're bringing in the olympics as well i mean we're, we're not taking any migration from overseas um immigration for for, for workers um you know it, it's a it's a very large workload but there's 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 going to be problems there with with actually delivering it well, one thing just you touched on the housing sort of boom that's going on in regards to you know because the governments through COVID have incentivized um uh loans and grants and that to homeowners uh similar to what they did in the gsc but um i was actually building a house so fortunately i started started a little bit before the the gfc hit and uh as an owner builder and so i was pretty well heading for the end of the end of the road and i was never entitled to any any grants anyway but what what we found is uh those grants that in regional Victoria at the time I was in, they sort of went up to about 62,000 you could get if you build a new house in the regions. And I think it was about 32,000 in the basically the greater Melbourne area. But when it was all said and done, by the time people would finish their houses and pay for all their costs, they'd actually, they'd actually got no benefit from the grant because materials went up labor went up and just the time delays for you know, carrying carrying the house getting built you're carrying that mortgage and all those sort of things was absolutely no benefit to the house owner but gee mm. didn't the building companies and the and the tradies make a fortune and this seems to be the same thing now you would yep. think the housing cost in australia is so high you would think the government should just let them cool down. They shouldn't, every time it has a downturn, they shouldn't pop, climb it up again. They should get bounced. But anyway, that's that's for wiser men than me to decide. But if I could just go, go back to one thing in regards to, we had David Littlefrout on the radio here about a week or two weeks ago. And he was giving, giving us a bit of a lecture on Queensland and uh, what the Commonwealth government has got and what the state government is not doing whereas the Tasmanian government and industry are They're holding out their hand and putting up great cases, to get Commonwealth money. And unfortunately, the Queen, buckets, those buckets of money are there for Queensland as well. But the Queensland government doesn't seem to be that interested in getting money off the Commonwealth. And even some of the money that's there now, they're not spending. And, and this just brings to me another point. Like, you're talking about the budgets. Uh, the state's got sixty billion dollars in the budget to you know distribute, but its revenue base is only about 42, 41, 42 billion dollars. That gap between what the state revenue is, including GST and and those official grants that go through Treasury, another eighteen odd million dollars is actually, from what I can gather, is Commonwealth money that's sitting there that doesn't go through Treasury. But the government, state government's going to draw down on, or say the Bruce Highway work or some other work. Is is that the case? Is that is that the discrepancy between revenue in going to the treasury and the figure they talking about in the budget? Well, well, the Queensland budget, it, it's actually fifty percent of it comes from GST redistributions, um, which is which has been a bit of a boon for um, uh, for the for the Queensland government this year, as it as it it uh, it did increase quite um, quite significantly. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the, you've had the argy bargy about the politics and everything for a long time, and it's not the first time um, it's been spoken about where the state government, you know, uh, will will play politics on on these sort of issues, and um, and you know, certainly the, the the federal government have stumped up money and it and it, and it hasn't been spent. Um, you know, th there's a lot sitting there. I, I just went, I went up to, to drove up to Townsville um, a couple of months ago and I just got back from Yapoon yesterday. Um, and there's still, there's, there is an enormous amount of work going along uh, the Bruce Highway, um, you know, sig significant amount of work. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much all the way up. You're obviously not working on it all, all, all parts at the same time, um, but there's certainly some significant works going on there. Um, you know, the, the argy-bargy, uh, we've got an election coming this year and, and obviously the, the Queensland government, have, have, you know, we, we've seen it with, with, with COVID and everything. You've got those, you know, those, um, those, what would you say, um, the, those, you know, political games that are going on. Um, you know, how you can sort of, you know, to, to sort that out, um, I don't think you can. I think that's sort of the, the, the politicians are in it for the games and, and they want to stay in power. And, and it's, uh, you know, in Queensland in particular, it's always been an us and them um, sort of parochial sort of view. Um, you know, but essentially the federal government has done a lot of the heavy lifting for for what's been going on, especially since COVID with, with job job keeper and the job seeker payments. Um, it's put a lot of money into the economy, uh, probably far too much. Some might say far too much. Obviously, a lot of it's gone to corporates that never needed it. Um, but, you know, it's given a retail sales were at record levels over the, particularly over the COVID uh, regions that's been a that that's been a, a boon for for uh, for some retailers in some sectors not all um, but uh, when you're looking at 35 percent of retail sales is in supermarkets anyway it doesn't you know it only leaves two-thirds of it left the, the crumbs for for all of the other industries um, but you know when, when you're looking at that infrastructure how you can sort of have the state and the Commonwealth work together and, and you know, for, for, um, for the same purpose, uh, I guess that's, you know, I don't know how you can, you can manage that, especially in an election year. Oh, well, I think one of the other thing is, I mean, you're saying the Commonwealth don't, can do the heavy lifting. Well, the Commonwealth should do the heavy lifting. It, it collects 90% of all yep. tax revenue, you know, from excise to income tax, which were originally under the constitution was a state, uh, responsibility and power. They, they ceded it to the Commonwealth during World War II yep. for the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately for them, they let it go for a while because from my understanding, we still had rationing up into the 1950s. So the war mentality didn't go away as soon as the war ended and state governments didn't ask for it back. It wasn't until um, I think New South Wales challenged demanded it back and ended up going to a high court and the high court well basically says well you haven't worried about it for this long so you know good luck chums we we think the commonwealth's doing it now that's not to my my i think there's a lot of bad decisions made by the high court you know in contravention of what the intent of the constitution was but that's, that's what higher powers than me do you know but yeah. um i think i think if I think there's a lot of a lot of high up academic law uh, professors, law professors, and that on constitutional law, who think some of the decisions of the high court stink. Um, but just, just touching on that, the Commonwealth's got the bulk of money, so the thing is they should be financing right these wealth creation projects, and they should be looking out for what's going to benefit the nation, like things like the Bradfield scheme. Uh, Sure, the state, state governments have got to make sure their roads and, and are, uh, up to scratch and also um, being planned to handle extra volumes of traffic because growing population you know, and that forward planning. But the actual things that grow the pie and after COVID, we'd, we're in a situation where we desperately need to grow the pie for the nation. Mm -hmm. And those projects are really 
only go to get a Guernsey from the Commonwealth um, government because if the Commonwealth government can can recognise and classify projects as a, as a major project of, of importance and give it clear air to get through some of the processes. Um, we've got things like a project Iron Boomerang that's been hanging around in the background for a decade or so. I mean, they've been trying to get pro um, major project status for some time, but no one's coming to the party with that. Yet over in West Australia, we have Murchis and Hydrogen doesn't even only just got a feasibility plan and that's about it for a $53 billion uh, green hydrogen uh, set up. And that, they've got pro major project status you know, and, they, and they haven't even got a market. So, you know, it's sort of beggars belief how they can choose these projects. So, I'm Boomerang is, is has to be a major project for consideration to grow the pie where we actually something with our own iron ore and our own coal and, and manufacture steel and export that instead of just the iron ore and the coal. So how do you how do you think is there a role for, for lobbyists? I mean Shane Connor and his crew have been pushing it over and over, but who 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 do you need to take up the cudgel for these people to get these these uh, wealth creation projects you know on, on the board? Well, well, certainly, and, and I'll touch on on a few of the things there. The obviously, what you, you're talking about is the um, the way that the Commonwealth Grants Commission um, essentially, as as you did mention, when when um, uh, they've set this up and it's it's been around uh, for a long time, but it hasn't really had a lot of changes since you know the federation. Um, but after the Second World War, as as you mentioned, the the we've got this thing where we've got vertical fiscal um, inequality. Horizontal where, physical equalization. Yeah, well, it's the horizontal fiscal equalization is where they try and, you know, distribute it among the states so that every um, Australian within each, you know, can enjoy the same um, services as uh, no matter where you live, which is why different states, especially, you know, remote or um, decentralized states uh, typically will will have a higher level of need um, but as you mentioned the the federal government take all of the taxes but the state government state and local governments are responsible for all of the services which is obviously where that problem um, you know arises and 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 when, when you look at the duplication we've got state health departments which are responsible for health but we've also got a federal health department um, you know, we've got a federal education department when they're not responsible for education and, and we've got all of this sort of duplication and everything um, that goes on. But getting back to Pro Project Eye and Boomerang and, you know, and you've got Copper String, th these things are, will be important projects. And, and I totally agree with you, especially with, with China's tantrum. Um, you know, our, our exports have halved, uh, merchandise exports have halved to China. Uh, they're still our biggest uh, 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 export destination by by far, um, but you know they they pretty much they cut the cut our coal by phenomenally by half as well as our LNG, um, our our copper ore dropped two hundred billion. They they don't take any of that anymore. Um, beef dropped last year as well, um, and you know we've got other uh, things as well, which is wine, which Queensland you know doesn't export a lot of wine to to China, but. You know, now now they're starting to, you know, iron ore prices are coming off. And, and this is, a, I mean, this is this is important that if you want to bring back manufacturing as well, I mean, Project Iron Boomerang is, is a perfect example of, of an industry where, where that can that can take place. Um, you know, I, I totally agree with you that it's certainly worth going forward and, and, it, and it will take the feds to come on board and identify it because um, as the state governments you know, uh, won't be in positions to be able to fund it, um, you know, so it's going to have to be a, a federal government um, uh, project. And, and I, you know, I do wish the advocates well. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, we, we have to, as you mentioned, after, after COVID, we, we really have to, 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 you know, push things forward uh, because we're, the gross debt's now over a trillion dollars um, federally. 
So, you know, this is going back to when we were sitting at, you know, 300 billion and, and um, after the GFC and, and the, the Liberals didn't want to, you know, allow them to push the, um, you know, to, to take the debt threshold for more than 300 billion. And now we're sitting at over a trillion. Um, you know, so we, we, somehow we're going to have to pay that back. I, I don't know how we're going to, and I don't think it, I don't think it's really possible. I don't think US will ever pay their debt back either, and neither will Japan. Um, you know, we've got economists now that, that that have come up with a new theory that, you know, essentially as long as you can print your own currency, then debt doesn't matter. I mean, the, you've got this new modern monetary theory that's come out. Um, you know, with with low interest rates and that, then government should continue to borrow but at some stage someone's going to have to pay the piper aren't they i mean and and how they're going to pay it is I, i'm not sure well, I, I suppose we are fortunate from my understanding we do borrow all our money in australian dollars so um i suppose we can print it and just give them uh stuff to stick on their their walls just like uh germany did after world war one yeah. Um, <laughs> so well, that, that's well, that, I mean that that is that is a funny thing with Australia though, because most of it, most of our debt is issued overseas, which is very different to the situation where, um, you know, we've got uh, we've got 40 percent of our um, our debt to to GDP, whereas you look at Japan and it's over you know over two hundred and seventy percent. But the thing is that 90 percent, over ninety percent of the debt that, that um, in, in Japan is owned by its own people, is owned by its own public. So that it's very different, which is why Australia is really, you know, is, is really, it's considered a commodity currency. And, um, and it's certainly, you've got those issues of capital flight because if foreign investors are spooked, um, you know, and, and pull their money out, then it's gonna be very hard for, for Australia to fund its own, its own debt. If we moved into the big ticket items that the state government uh, is running, sort of thing like the, the Cross Cross River Rail, uh, it is, is a big project. I think it was originally set out to be about $5 billion. I think it's at seven now. And yeah. no, no one would be surprised when it's all finished if it comes in at about 11 or something like yeah, that. Definitely. And then you've got to go on to the Olympic Games and the spend, although the... It's one of the things they say, well, we've got a lot of the infrastructure in the earth and the facilities already from um, the Commonwealth Games and stuff like that. But we all know that's that's a furphy. There's got to be huge expenditure built there. Now, that expenditure is all right. It creates jobs and things like that and circles. It makes the economy uh, continue sort of thing. But there's nothing wealth creating about it. If, if you look at... Uh, say the Cross River uh, Rail, it doesn't actually generate any wealth. I mean, people will be taking fares, trips across it, but they won't even be paying the cost. I think I think I read some time ago that every every trip in in the metro uh, Brisbane metro area actually the taxpayer spends it to a tune of about eleven dollars per trip. So. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no wealth creation from that, and there's we no real wealth creation from building uh, another stadium or a few roads down the southeast. Do you see that uh, the mentality of the government has to change in regard to, well, we really have to create uh, wealth or focus on wealth creating projects that a opens up more land so there's more agriculture and more exports or. Uh, or grazing, or more mining, uh, more more ability to process minerals and things like that. And to me, those things are, are only going to happen in the regions. You're not going to open up agriculture in, in the great southeastern corner. You're not going to open up mines or metal processing. So, how do we get the government to focus on the regions and hopefully have some money for the regions to build these wealth creating projects? Or, 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 or are we lost? Well, you're certainly you're certainly right. Um, I, my own personal view is that the Cross River Rail was a vanity project of Jackie Trad. Um, you know, essentially, you know, getting people from South Brisbane over to the Gabba to watch the football quicker. Um, I, I really didn't see much of a benefit in it, considering, um, you know, you've got you've got Southwest Queensland 
running out of water, which is our food bowl, um, you know, where they weren't building dam, they wouldn't build dams for them or or, or anything or, or develop so we can, you know, to to essentially grow the pie, as you're saying. Um, you know, the the only benefit really now is that, you know, it, the Cross River Rail will benefit us through the Olympic Games. And when you're looking at the Olympic Games, I went to a lot of the road shows and essentially a lot of the Southeast Queensland mayors, the reason that they're so sanguine and, and, and positive about it is obviously they're gonna benefit the most from the infrastructure spends. But essentially the, the, it's to lock a time frame in because the Queensland government has essentially underspent in infrastructure for, for a long time. If you, if you go back to 2009 and 10, um, it, the, the the money spent it was only a forty billion budget, and and essentially over twenty billion dollars uh, of the of the budget, um, you know forty six percent so a little bit under twenty billion, forty six percent of it was of the budget was actually spent in infrastructure. Now you're you're looking down to to you know about twenty percent of the budget is 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 spent or you know uh, essentially it was fourteen billion in in capital works and. Uh, 14.6 billion in capital works as well as grants for this year, um, you know, and and it's a 60 billion dollar budget. I mean, they they've completely underspent in infrastructure for for too long. Um, obviously, the the they built you know built, rebuilding their public service over over those years as well has played a lot of part in that, um, where those expenses as a proportion of the the budget have increased. Um, but, but, you know, this is, this is the frustration and, and the thing is, it's, there's a lot more seats, uh, down in, in Brisbane and, you know, being from regional Queensland, I, I totally agree, uh, with a lot of advocates up there about, um, uh, you know, bye bye. Politics. Bye bye so, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, my, my role as I saw it with CCIQ was to, to bring some, uh, you know, to bring some of these, to, to, to go into the look at the regions, you know, look at their economies and 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 what's going on, and to, you know, to to try and sort of educate people in southeast Queensland that, you know, the wealth is being generated outside of SEQ, if, if, you know, the 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 dollar wealth, um, you know, but predominantly you've got you've got twenty percent of of businesses in Brisbane that rely on the mining uh, supply chain, so that they're, they're directly linked, um, you know, but. Uh, politicians are obviously going to be more focused around you know uh, brisbane because there's more seats here and seq to 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 gain power um you know they're, they're politicians they're not really looking forward to to you know what's going to happen into the state and you know for after when they leave i think i think the thing there is it's just an election cycle thing mm -hmm. and in your point about dams well i can i can see i can see their point not building dams because it's never going to rain again to fill the dams up. You know, we've been told that for what twenty years now. So Tim <laughs> maybe that maybe that that's that's still in their, in their brain. But but yeah. the, the scary thing is we've got got the situation with Queensland. We've got a bulk of water. We 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 need to harvest it and, yep. and distribute it to where it needs. But we've got a situation. You know, just up the road from you, you've got Bundaberg and the Paradise Dam. You know. Mm -hmm. That dam could have been saved. You know, the farmers group and that they brought out one of the leading experts in in those uh, layered earth dams, layer of cement and earth dams, and he basically said you can fix it. You know, for for not too much money. And the fix was because the type of dam and it was there was um, separation of the layers on, on in the horizontal plane and. The fix was is just drill pylons down to the bedrock, lock it all in, and and leave it. She should be right. And he even said, well, even under current circumstances, it's got a significant amount of time where it's still going to be safe. <laughs> but mm -hmm. hearing any sort of litigation, I suppose they just chopped about six or seven meters off the top, reduced mm -hmm. the capacity, and now yeah. basically all those farmers who invested up in Bundaberg region for macadamias, which take massive amounts of water. They're, you know, they're horrible things in regards, regards to first, mm. and they're basically going to be decimated because there's not going to be anywhere near the water allocation for, for the agriculture that's planned there. And mm. government doesn't seem to have anything in its mind to say, well, no, this has been a monumental 
no stuff up. Let's you know, build another dam in front of it and get it right and so we can get the storage up. No. Nah. And then you got the Burdigan Dam, and you'd be very familiar with the Burdigan Dam. Mm -hmm. no, it was came out, it came was planned and all that under under um, Joe's period. It was built and finished, I think, in '86. But it always had this stage two vision, where as as the area grew, they could add another 14.6 meters on top, spillways in it, control the flow a lot better, and the set, uh, sediment going over the over the side into the reef. So it had all, the, and so what now? Because this hydrogen project is sort of being talked about in council, they need more water. Mm. So sun water comes up with oh stage two. We'll add two meters to the top, maybe six, maybe, but it's going to be two. That's the, if you read the read their plan and that it looks like it's going to be the two. But when they put that two meter cap on, that's the end of the dam. You can never increase it to the to the full height again so that is regressive like it, <laughs> My is, there any, any, is there anything that's progressive in regards to what the state government is going to live for central and north queensland in particular because it certainly doesn't seem to be we can't even get a new road over the range to open up an economic co corridor between cairns and, and the gulf and the tableland so mm -hmm. where, where's where's these planners we've got a department of i think it's called uh, regional development and water or something but mm. i'm pretty sure it should be renamed to regional stagnation right because it doesn't seem to be in, in implementing or planning anything for regional regional queensland mm. no certainly um and you know I, I wrote an article for the for the australian especially around the um uh around the time that that um that, that adani was going through all of its problems um you know so you know obviously i was i was working at the chamber when they were gluing themselves to the to the street and everything um you know getting to work in the, in the morning was a little bit more difficult but um you know through all of that nonsense you know jackie trad bringing al gore over and paying him three hundred thousand dollars to to speak to you know to to the um to the disciples but um, you know, you're you're essentially right, and and I I wrote this piece that you know as I as I left Townsville because it went through that deep depression when the when Clive Palmer's uh, Queensland Nickel went down, um, and this is at the same time Townsville City Council were running redundancies and, uh, as well as um, you know through their restructure as well as JCU at the same time, and and essentially those forces together, you know the. The, in the towns of SA, SA4 region itself, you know, 15,000 jo less jobs and, and people, there was just an exodus from, from Townsville. And I wrote that unless we can start getting some significant projects like like stadiums and, and, and these sort of things and um, the pipeline are, are, you know, are great on headlines, but, but they're not going to be what is needed to 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 grow the pie like you know the the, the politicians like to throw the hard hats on and uh, and everything that like that and um you know the, the the funniest thing was that you know there was always that when i was at the chamber the, when jackie trad was in you know there was this power struggle between you know the, the left and the sort of the right of the of, of the government there and um there was a lot of tension there and and um you know and obviously with with uh, Jackie Trad coming out at the time saying we're going to have to reskill all of our, you know, all of our coal miners and everything like this. You know that it was her view and and the view of the in a, you know in a Brisbane city um, folk that you know that we're going to move away from coal and mining because I don't because I don't think they really understand what what it contributes how how much that you know that this is what we are a farm and quarry economy we're we're not latte um, dependent uh you know like, like melbourne and sydney where where they have a lot of tourism and, and a lot of international education um the, the education international education makes up a very small amount of uh, of our gross state product compared to the, the uh the southern states but um i don't think they i really don't think they get it so you know i wrote a piece and said unless we start to to build these you know significant projects um, you know, in particular, develop our agricultural and 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 mining industry. 
Um, you know, where there's not a lot of people employed directly by mining, but there's, you know, the, the, the amount of, of that we generate from it and the supply chain that are connected to it um, certainly make up for a significant a lot more than, than what's directly employed. Um, and, you know, we need these industries to, to, to move forward, especially to repair all of the damage that's been done. And obviously hiding behind COVID is one thing, but the finances were pretty disgraceful before that. We've had uh, expenses in the government rising quicker than, than, uh, than revenues, which has been pointed out by the Auditor General as a problem. And 30% and of the councils who, in, their, in, in another report, uh, were, were under financial serious financial stress, distress. So, um, you know, the, how are you going to get that mentality, you know, um, out of, you know, from inner city Brisbane and, and for them to actually, to, to, to see how the economy actually works. Cut them off. I, I don't think they, you know, they, they don't get it. And, you know, I, I don't know how you can change that. Another thing I think also is, the government's interfering too much in the, in the marketplace in regards to picking favourites. If, if you look at renewable energy in particular, I mean, that's something that the market should have, you know, come forward with as, as it got better or whatever. But between, between the federal government and the state governments, they've thrown, you know, literally tens of billions of dollars at in grants where we get no equity in these projects and then in the poor old consumer we've got no idea what the confidential tariff agreements are with some of these renewables but they're the things that they're getting involved in where really that's something the market should have been looking at and and a really the government better have start having a close look at what's going on in britain at the moment when they have things called wind droughts and Mm. Actually, sometime before they had the nine-day drought, now they're in the, in the period where they're actually into about five days of wind drought, and it's causing havoc yep. in, in in Britain. So, unless they can, unless they sort of look at the whole picture, of what the, what they're trying to cobble together and force on on the people of Queensland and the industry of Queensland, I think we're going to have some real, real problems. Yeah, well, definitely. And and you talked a little bit about the different, you know, shades of, of hydrogen. Um, you know, essentially, we, we had the Resource Council um, the chief talk to us at our chamber uh, a couple of months ago as well. Um, you know, and essentially, we... The focus on this green is obviously to do with the trendy, you know, renewables and 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 you know, action on climate change and reducing emissions and everything. But we can we can already extract hydrogen from you know from our LNG uh, projects as as we got it as a byproduct. And and I, I don't know why that hasn't even been considered. Why we've got to build these green hydrogen um, hubs, you know, which, which still aren't viable um, at the moment. Um, you know, obviously they're hoping that technology in the future will make it um, sort of viable so it won't need the subsidies and that. But, you know, it, it's just we've already got the ability to create hydrogen through as, you know, in line with some of our existing industries. And I don't, you know, I, I don't know why they're not capitalising on that as well as this, you know, the move to the to the to the green hydrogen. So, I mean, that's that's essentially where I sit on that. I, I you know, I, I don't understand why, you know, why that's not being pursued. But, um, but we seem, seem to be doing this all, all for the benefit of overseas people like Japan mm. and, and Europe. We're, you know, we're not doing it. We don't need hydrogen itself and we're not really going to use overly much of it uh, because we're still going to have, regardless of what people say, we're still going to use our, uh, our natural gas and which dividend we give up our strategic advantage of coal. Mm. But... Um, it, it does beg a bigger belief that um, it's turn, turn around and encourage an industry, a new industry, and at the same time beat the, try to beat the death. An industry actually is that's generating volumes of revenue for not only the state but for the nation and, and employment. It, see, it seems a fairly ludicrous thing to do, but there again, I mean, 
Yeah. Um, you can't help ideology and, and, and being idiots at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> totally agree. And, and, and I mean, this, the, the funny thing is, I don't know if you looked at the, at the budget, but the, the actual dividends from our, um, from our two, uh, from our energy, um, statutory institutions. So those, those companies owned by the, by the government, I said outside. So those dividends have fallen significantly over, over the last year, um, as renewables have started to take on. So the budget's taken a hit as well on, on, you know, that, well, that, that doesn't seem, I mean, you're supposed to be renewal. there looking after, after the interest in, of the hmm. Queensland people, yet you're turning around and, and doing something like murdering the, murdering their income the sort of thing. Mm. Uh, for, for, and the thing is, what you're doing is delivering it really, in most cases, to foreign foreign investors and that. And then although some of these companies have got a Australian label sort of thing, the actual backers and who they send their money is over, overseas. Yeah. So, you know, companies, so people need to get understand. They might have a front shop door that says Energex Australia or something, but don't forget what their big office is in New York or whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> me... A, it's a little bit treasonous, I think, that you're sort of you're doing doing your own own economy in for the benefit of others. But before we go on, one thing I'd just like to talk about is your experience with the reef regulations and and your modelling for that. And how does that sort of how do you feel that lines up with the arguments that are coming back now in regards to, especially from Peter Peter Red in regards to. You know, some of, some of this science that we've been sort of looking at is a bit iffy in, mm -hmm. you know, in the eyes of some people. But I mean, of course, um, there's others who keep saying, well, the reef is dying and then we will die unless we do all these sort of things. Mm. Well, well I, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I always had um, a little bit of tension where, where, you know, my role I saw was to, to assist um, businesses and, and particularly the the agricultural industry at the time um i definitely saw a lot of problems with, with a lot of the data that was coming out um there were very small samples and and a lot of them hadn't been reproduced as as peter uh mentioned i was actually working at jcu while peter was still there and i had a few i was in the email trail talking to him and totally agreed with him that that we should have a, an audit um, an independent audit um, office to to look at some of the science coming out because there were problems with a lot of the studies and, and you're going to get that when you've got small samples and and, and reef science was only 30 years you know it's only about 30 years old and, and a lot of it's intermittent data it's it's not long-running sort of sort of data as they were saying and a lot of the tests that I did when they're talking about you know, particularly, you know, ch climate change is going to to affect rainfall and, and all of this and, and, you know, we're going to have more storms and everything. You know, I, the tests that I, I ran, I, I ran a few stationarity tests, a so unit root test, so you're looking whether the, whether the, the patterns, uh, the monthly rainfall was, was random or not. And, and my, the, the outputs that I got, uh, particularly for the Burdekin when I looked at it, were, was that rainfall is completely random. So if that's random, then um, you know, how much of climate change is random? I mm. mean, you know, if, if something, if, it's easy to, to lump all of this into sort of climate change, but the, you've got to look at the specifics of what are you looking at? Are you looking at temperature? Are you looking at rainfall? And, and, and you need to test all of these sort of separately to see these are the parts of it. Is, is it really lining up with what, you know, a lot of these people are saying? Because it's, a lot of it's, you know, the, the studies aren't there and it's sort of it's sort of get, it's sort of guesswork for them and they you know they're the experts and we have to have to listen to them but a, a lot of the data didn't didn't line up and and i think peter's um certainly right to come out and and to to come out and, and a lot of them are, are my very good friends and and you know we we have you know we're very good friends but we have different opinions about um you know uh, about you know they're, they're passionate about their the reef and, and everything and we all are no, i mean no one wants to see the, the reef die and we want to see it flourish but um you know there's a there's a right way of doing it and 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 you know when, when you're looking at the amount of money that's getting thrown around with the five billion dollar reef trust you know there's, there's a lot of people with their hands in their pie here and and researchers you know rent seeking to 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 generate income for their universities um 
you know, we've, we've really got a problem there. And, and the, the peer review process, is he's totally right. I mean, marine science isn't like finance or, or, or another existing field that's been around for a long time. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's only a small amount of, of, of researchers. And, and you're obviously going to get that problem where you've got groupthink and, and, and as far as a scientific consensus, I mean, that's an oxymoron. There's, there's no such thing. Not in science. No, and if you if, if you've got a consensus and you've got a problem, <laughs> I think think um, it goes back more than fifty years. But uh, in his farewell speech, speech to the United States when uh, Dwight Eisenhower left the White House, in his farewell speech, he spelled it out fairly clearly there the dangers of you know pulling government uh, mm. research and things like that where things are grants and and. And it become, will become a problem for government if they don't control that input and 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 sort of audit it because they'll be taking direct directions off people who never want a solution. Yep. Um, so yep. he, he, he warned us. You know, what was that? Nineteen sixty-one, I think, when mm. he handed over power. So that's how long ago, you know, it was first. We were first all warned. But just touching on another thing with the reef. In regards to you know, fertilizers and pesticides, I think one of the things that a lot of people haven't taken into account is human, human advancement or technological advancement. We're now in the era of nanotechnology. And I've got my brother in law works in the um, lawn field and has a license to grow different types of uh, grass, which he gets a royalty from without doing anything, which is a pretty good way to operate. Yeah, he, he went to the United States a couple of years ago now, and advances in, in uh, especially fertilizers, the first one, but there are also in regards to getting fertilizer right near the near the plant system, and so it doesn't actually leach away from any anything at all. It's mm. it's becoming really incredible. So this old days of you know what we. We used to have the old superphosphate bounty. I was came from Western Australia, and the wheat farmers used to have the bounty, and they used to throw it everywhere because yeah. the more they put on, the more they got, you know, the more mm -hmm. funds they got. But that's not something that happens anymore. You know, that's no. you know, realistically these people who are, you know, the signers that look at it really need to look at what a farmer's got to do. He's not going to spend money where he doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. He's not going to waste fertilizer. He's not going to waste pesticides. So, I, th I think they're sort of um, vilifying people that don't need to vilify and they just need to understand what the actual job is. Um, but anyway, that's, that's my little thing on it. But well, the, I mean, that's the thing that, you know, it's, it's hard to herd cats, which is what we had. Like we had a whole, you know, growers are very different and some of them are, you know, as you said, the, we, we dealt with primarily the sort of better ones, the ones in Project Catalysts and all of that that wanted to work with us to develop their practices and wanted to see the research how's it going to affect my bottom line you know how am i going to you know they're proactive to 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 towards the environment because i mean they, they love the reef most of them have got boats and and spend a lot of time fishing when they're not farming um you know so it's you know um to think that you know that they're, they're all environmental vandals and trying to destroy the reef and all you know the, the sort of what was getting thrown around and what people in Brisbane sort of thought was, you know, in, in their windowless offices in, in William Street, um, you know, I went there a couple of times and, and, you know, some of the stuff that I heard, because we, we were essentially funded at DAF um, by the Department of Environment, all of our projects. So, so we had that problem too, where, you know, a lot, all the funding's coming from the Department of Environment and, you know, so, so we had to essentially, you know, <laughs> look, at what, look at what they wanted. Make sure what, what, yes, what, 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 well, what, what, you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know, no, it's, it's I, 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 I was, I was in, on, I was in defense funny. procurement for for a number of years and that, and really, it's a tough, tough job to sort of break it. I tell them uh, that's fine, but you know, this is what you really want. Mm. It's it's just mindsets that locked in. From, yep. from our history sort of thing and, and it's so hard to shake and really mm -hmm. you've got to be prepared to sort of put your head on the chopping block if you actually if you want to do improve the system and and that's that's the unfortunate part 
Well, a lot of it, they, they didn't look at what was coming out of the cities either, all of the, you know, the stuff from development. I mean, they, the, the farmers were just the, you know, the easy targets and, that, and that's essentially how it sort of turned out, you know. Uh, it's, um, well, yeah. They, they never want to come around my place and wanted to the runoff from my place because I reckon I'm the biggest user of Roundup ever. For, yeah. <laughs> because really? there's one thing about North Queensland, it just grows and grows and grows and, yep. and the greatest greatest growers are weeds you know it's just yep. a, it's a natural thing obviously you've got the right genetics to thrive no matter what and yep. gee, I, I reckon between all the people in 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 cans in in the domestic situation spraying ground up <laughs> we'd beat the we'd beat the farmers hands down because bunning does, does a massive trade in in, in uh round up yeah, well, well, the thing is, I mean, even the late John Brady, who was a leading researcher and, and passed recently, but, um, you know, I did a lot on the pesticide stuff and, and um, it, obviously we did the nutrients and that as well, but the C, we worked with the CSIRO um, in conjunction with them on a few projects and they led the nitrogen and we did the pesticides, but pesticides because, you know, um, because they dissipate very, very quickly and, and uh, you know, the, the, probably by the time they they end up into the into the rivers, and then by the time they end up in the lagoon, they're 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 that broken down that that he didn't seem to think that you know they were even that big a problem. Um, it was more the nitrogen, obviously, you know, that they they that was feeding the you know traveling north and feeding the um, feeding the crown of thorns starfish larvae, and and that was that was a big obviously a big issue um you know from, from what they saw um but as, as you mentioned i mean growers aren't going to be throwing away money they're not you know it's not as you said it's not the old days where they just throw it on you know well, really nearly, <laughs> yeah because it, it's it's expensive and uh you know and they're, they're not they're not going to waste money yeah. um and then the issue really was is is that there was no form of insurance and and they did a lot on you know what what's the 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 optimal level of of nitrogen for the uptake and they've, they've done a lot of research on that and everything um but a lot of the a lot of the studies that you see like you know the the replications and that they look at blocks and and even between one block it is it is a very different soil profiles all the way through and you know and it's you know comparing you know one treatment to another when you've got a completely different blocks um you know there, there was problems in that as well uh you know with comparing those so um you know where the i wish all all my colleagues I've, I've still got a lot of colleagues that are working in the area and um you know and i and i wish them well um but and and i hope it's i haven't sort of been in the area for a few years but i but i hope i certainly hope it's getting a lot better than what i saw back in um you know 2012 to 2014 um so I, i'm really hoping the science was is a lot stronger than what it was then that's all, that's um, all we, we're well over our hour but um mm -hmm. before, before we will wrap up um i really i suppose the theme really of the talk is basically is the southeast is just either not in a position or not willing to commit billion dollar projects to the regions which is are the only areas you actually go to grow the pie mm -hmm. um how we've only got a small number of politicians in the state parliament i think central and north queensland's only got 17 in the whole parliament yep how who do we how do you appeal to the political class in regards to changing the focus get them to focus on growing the pie projects and delivering something to the regions that you know, are capable of growing the pie or it's just not going to happen you know, it, there's, it's just they're too just focused on that southeast corner building stadiums for the plebs you know just like coliseums for the plebs um you see um buildings and all those sort of things that make make a lot of amenity down there for the three and a half million vanity rail projects yeah vanity rail projects and I, I mean all those things are not going to deliver anything to the growth of pie so mm -hmm. how, how do we really appeal or, or make them wake up down there to say well or, or will it become such an imperative because 
the debt's got to keep growing, you know, and we've got to, we've actually got to do things that don't, are going to improve revenue. Well, What's going to come first, the realization or the crash? Well, I mean, I think, I, I, I think, have you seen, have you seen the recent um, um, internal migration? Because we haven't got much uh, immigration coming. We've got a few <laughs> expats coming back, but we've had uh, they lost over the last twelve months uh, to June. The you know the um, the migration out of uh, Victoria was fourteen thousand, and and a similar amount come out of New South Wales, and they've been coming to Queensland and, and WA. So predominantly, we've got we've got even though population growth itself, because we're missing the the international migration, but internal migration used to be actually stronger than what we're seeing at the moment through COVID, even though it's very elevated. Mm. It, it's a lot less than what it was going back in, in previous decades. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we're going to have more people coming and, and there's been a trend, a recent trend that a lot of them are going towards, not, not into Brisbane, and there's actually a, a, a net negative migra uh, internal migration within the state outside of Brisbane to the region. So the regions are going to be, you know, growing, which, which is great because some of the, the central Queensland regions that I looked at, their populations were actually decreasing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it, it'll be good to see these people, you know, to, to moving into the regions. And I guess uh, without, you know, opening up the state and, and providing all, all the infrastructure so that towns can develop um, and, and, you know, people can move to the regions, then um, I think they're going to stay fairly focused sort of in Brisbane. With, with these property prices, you know, hopefully we will see more people leaving, you know, the um you know the southeast and moving to the regions and because i think we've got a problem also with if we're going to develop it we're, we're going to need the skilled um workers which which we're really sort of lacking at the moment um you know i, I see that as a problem going forward as well uh, as getting back to the main question how we can change you know the, how, how we can make you know the, the, the Southeast Queensland focused politicians, you know, a, a little bit more receptive of about, um, you know, about what's going on in the regions and the requirements there and, and the potential uh, there. I mean, they're, they're going to be very myopic. I, I mean, that's that's politics, isn't it? So um, I, I don't know there. I, I, I can't answer that one myself. You know, it's frustrating, obviously, but um, I, I guess you just need advocates to, to keep pushing and, and you know, I think the, uh, the, the, the Commonwealth government, um, you know, are receptive towards developing Northern Australia, but we have been talking about that for a long time, remember? So yeah, it, it, what it, paper at, what la paper? at last, at least something has happened and the site is starting to get turned on a few of those projects, but we have been talking about it for a long time, um, you know, and, and, you know, it, it's just getting the right people in, in the, in the right position to, um, to be able to advocate for that and, um, you know, and, and the sooner the better, I, I hope so. I suppose we lack the visionary sort of thing who a big picture and nation building type thing. Mm. There's one sample I want to point out before we leave, you know, in, in the 1890s, West Australia only just become a self-governing uh, colony. And the first governor of, uh, premier at the time was Sir John Forrest. Now, the population only 100,000 people. He went out and borrowed two and a half million pounds. In today's money, that's $40 billion. Mm. Now that, that is pretty you know, visionary and say, well, I'm going to take on this debt because I think you know, we've got the potential for something. And he wasn't thinking about Perth. He was thinking about Kalgoorlie and Coolgardie. And so he borrowed that to nowadays $40 billion to build two dams in, in around the Perth in the uh, Darling Scarp, 500 kilometres of pipeline, four pumping stations to furnish Kalgoorlie with water. Those, that infrastructure is still there today. And mm -hmm. Kalgoorlie is still generating wealth for West Australia, not mm -hmm. only just in gold, but the Cambalda nickel fields opened up and that. So... That's the sort of visionary we need, and, and he was—he was the politician, but he was also a statesman, and he was obviously a person, you know, with 
much bigger shoes than any of these politicians could ever fill that we've got around these days. Yeah. It's, it's, it staggers me now that we have a population of Australia, 25 million people. We've got a great big, you know, we've got you know, plenty of wealth producing sort of uh, potential. Yet we still won't take that step and say, well, let's take the, let's spend for, borrow 40 equivalent to 40 billion dollars and get one of these visionary projects up you know, mm -hmm. like it's sort of like chalk and cheese how can someone back in you know, more than 100 years ago take that sort of risk and have that foresight and today with the much greater safeguards these people can't even put put together a five billion dollar project in regional queensland yep. throw the pie Yep. And that's that's extremely disappointing, and it's and it's both the state government and the federal government. So mm -hmm. my my suggestion is we need a North Queensland government. Yep. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of advocates that uh, that share the view. So um, yeah, it's um, whether I, I've had that whether I guess it's um, it, obviously there's a, there's Colin Dwyer's sort of um, you know is a. a, a, a regional economist based in Townsville that, that is obviously a proponent, um, strong proponent of that. And I also know a few other um, friends of mine that are, you know, and, and when you live in, uh, you know, um, north of Rockhampton, I guess it's uh, it's a no brainer. I mean, everyone, it's always been the view that, um, you know, North Queensland should be self-governed, but, um, you know, it's it's always been that, that uh, population uh, problem. So, um, you know, but, but hopefully as the population grows, uh, that, that won't be such well, a... Well, well Bernard Sol reckon the magic number is a million people for a new state, you know, when mm. he models it against Tasmania and other, and South Australia in particular. Yep. But but the problem is too many people, because I'm not a, no, I'm not a Queenslander, right? Mm. I've, I only moved here in 2012, so I've got no, no ties to anywhere and I'm not parochial about Queensland whatsoever or, or any region of Queensland. And if anything, I'm Australian first and always will be. And you only do things for the benefit of the population in general. And of course there's other bene beneficiaries. But yeah. I think the biggest problem with the North Queensland debate is it's been far too parochial and there's been no criteria set like the borders always you know, someone says this border, someone says no one knows where North Queensland boundary is gotta be. Well, yeah. you know, we've got this sort of situation where you've got to come up with a set of criteria and that's the that's what makes a state. Like, hey, you've got to have a population of roughly a million people. So your border needs to be expanded to make sure you've got that sort of thing that's gotta give you five federal seats, a yeah. big enough population to generate revenue and also provide the services that you need because mm -hmm. you're going to have going to have you have, have your bureaucracy and you're going to have the few extra politicians and and you've got to deliver all these services so yeah the first first step could have always been is well what's the criteria for a viable state and then start discussing the rest of it but you know we've had bob Catter talk about north queensland but you know sometimes he just waffles on about you know south of mackay that's serena you know Yep. You've only got 500 and something million pe uh, yeah, people there. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's that's not enough, you know. Yep. Um, so they need to get over those things. They've got to have a bit more of a plan. But uh, and there's also there's also the issue that I've, I've raised up is how much of the 130 billion dollars of debt are we going to allocate to North Queensland? Zero. No. <laughs> that's what they said. Zero. No, zero. <laughs> because it. it if, if, if you go and and all, I hate the UN, by the way, but there's definitely one one convention I will 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 hang on and hang my hat on is the 1983 Convention for Separation of, of it was originally primarily designed for uh, sovereign nation separation, like when Yugoslavia broke up and all those sort of things. But it's still applicable to a state. You cannot transfer debt. The mm. owner of the debt is the parliament. That got the debt so mm -hmm. they cannot transfer debt and the requirement is they have to transfer all assets that run the run in that uh, section of the that's being carved off stay there and that includes mobile assets anything like police cars fire engine anything that provides that's all put completely laid down so i'd argue we don't owe them anything and mm -hmm. hey we've been here for 160 years uh, funding you people down there 
get off your high horse and just let us go. And especially when you think we're too much of a drag on you anyway, so you should be spared to get, get rid of us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wish you well. So <laughs> putting that to them, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's certainly something going forward. I mean, I, I, I can see a, a North Queensland state sort of eventually, um, you know. Central and North Queensland state. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. Every, everything, everything that's co covered by the North, North Australian infrastructure fund in their little green map that's in Queensland, that's North Queensland. Everything yep. south of that, well, you can keep. Yep. <laughs> but, <laughs> excuse me. We're we'll, we'll winding up there. Um, but if you can just stay online, I'll just catch up with you in a second. I'll just wrap up this, this show. Not a problem at all. We've finished, finished tonight's episode. Um, if you've liked the show, please like, follow and subscribe to our Facebook channel. And next week, I'll get it up on screen. Next week's presentation will be with the Honourable Rod Borzak, New South Wales. New South Wales member of the Legislative Council, parliamentary leader of Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. It will be interesting conversation in regards to inroads that, that party has made in new, regional New South Wales after, over the last three elections to now have three seats in west of the divide and, and what their future is in regards to regional Queensland. So join me then on that show. Thanks very much.